And the man we're about to hear from is the person who has had 14 years at the helm of NICE. He, he was responsible for setting up the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in 1999. And this has since become, I think it's fair to say, the international exemplar of what such a group might be. Others have begun to challenge that position. That, I'll say that from the outset. ICWIG in Germany is doing a fantastic job. Um, but NICE, I think, remains the iconic and the first and the one that people turn to for um, their own attempts to set up similar rational uh, prescribing and rational decision-making bodies. So I think we have a huge amount to um, congratulate Mike Rawlins on as he steps out of the office, and it's really excellent that he's here to tell us his views on saints and sinners, the role of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, thank you very much. I've still got five days left as chairman, right, so I can still mess it up. Give me a chance. Um, but it's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Um, when I talk about pharma, I'm talking about big pharma, small pharma, tiny pharma, and I'm also talking about biopharma, just pharma. But before I begin, I'd just like to explain where I come from. Um, my musings are based on my experience as a clinician, and clinical pharmacologist in Newcastle for 33 years. As a member, vice chair, and chair on the Committee on Safety of Medicines, younger members of the audience may not know, but until about 1997, 98, uh, we regulated our own medicines in Britain, um, and, uh, and uh, the Committee on Safety of Medicines was the body that advised ministers on whether uh, drugs could go on the market or come off the market. Uh, ministers by convention always took the committee's advice, but if there was any trouble, the chairman went on the television, and that's how I started meeting John Humphreys. And then finally, uh, as, as chair of NICE, so it's, it's, it's with all, those, uh, um, uh, all that baggage that, uh, uh, that, I, uh, that I'm speaking today. The pharmaceutical industry is, views about the pharmaceutical industry is polarized between those who believe it is uh, saintly and those who are, believe that are, they're sinners and uh, almost as bad as the devil. Um, but um, over, as saints, the pharmaceutical industry has been responsible over the past uh, uh, 70 plus years for drug discovery, drug development, drug manufacture, drug distribution, a very complicated operation. And it is worth remembering that in 1965, the year I uh, uh, started my first uh, house job, um, the therapeutic armamentarium was pathetic. Uh, we had no beta-2 ag agonists for the treatment of asthma. We relied on isoprenolin. We had no oral diuretics. Uh, we had some stuff called Mercil, you've probably never heard of. Uh, we had no modern antihypertensive drugs. We had no non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs apart from aspirin and phenylbutazine. Uh, we had uh, uh, the only uh, treatment for depression were monoene oxidase inhibitors, and we had only chlorpromazine for schizophrenia. And the pharmaceutical industry has unquestionably provided us with many, many important tools for respiratory disease, for cardiovascular disease, for gastroenterology, uh, H2 antagonists, and more recently proton pump inhibitors. Surgical wards have closed. Very few surgeons nowadays know how to do uh, uh, a selective vagotomy and pyloroplasty. Um, but uh, um, they've just about disappeared. And in mental health, uh, we have antipsychotic drugs uh, and antidepressants, uh, which are substantial advances on what we had then. And there's other successes. We have modern vaccines, influenza, uh, HPV, Rotavirus is particularly important in developing countries. Uh, in oncology, we've had some successes, and we will come on to in a moment. In neurology, we have much better anticonvulsants than we had when I was a lad, and we have combined oral contraceptives, um, all of which have been important. But there is also what's often unmet, called unmet medical need. I, I don't like the term unmet medical need, actually, because it just sort of covers everything. But there are two classes of diseases for which we have virtually no useful form of treatment. Um, neurodegenerative disorders, not only the ones listed here, but things like Lewy body dementia, uh, CJD, Pick's disease, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have things that are m slightly improved symptomat symptomatically, um, but uh, we can have no idea of how to change the natural history of the progression of any of these neurodegenerative disorders. And the older I get, the more worried I am about what's going to happen. 
Similarly, malignant disease, you know, a diagnosis of lung cancer is, a, is basically a death sentence uh, for anything, um, uh, uh, any, any uh, uh, advanced prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, we really have palliative care. Now, I don't want to knock palliative care, but we don't have anything approaching curative forms of treatment. There's a lot we need to do. What about pharma as sinners? Well, there are, broadly speaking, three sins um, for my money, uh, from the pharmaceutical industry. Firstly, the business model has been dependent over the last 50 or 60 years on high-volume products, blockbusters, with a relative neglect, not absolute, but relatively, of less common conditions, and relatively high acquisition costs of products. The acquisition costs are driven in part, uh, and in the last, last decade or two, in considerable part, by the complexities of drug development uh, and the requirements of drug regulatory authorities, which I believe uh, have now become quite outrageous. Uh, and uh, uh, unless something happens, new drugs are going to cost so much to develop, none of us anywhere in the world will be able to afford them. But nevertheless, uh, high acquisition costs are also important for pharmaceutical companies as commercial enterprises, uh, the chief executives, bonuses, tend to be linked to the share price. So they want to make profits, and that's perfectly reasonable, and they want to make good profits. Secondly, marketing practices. Over the years, there has been many instances of inappropriate, outrageous behavior in relationship to marketing and pharmaceuticals. Guest authorship, just asking somebody whether you like the name on the clinical trial. Involvement of physicians in promotion. Uh, in uh, educational meetings at exotic lo locations and promotion of use in unlicensed indications. Now, I have to say this is far worse on the other side of the Atlantic is here in Britain. And the reason why it's no longer happening so nearly so much in Britain is because of the influence of the medical profession. The medical profession itself said this sort of behavior is intolerable. And the pharmaceutical industry backed away, rightly so. So we now don't have educational meetings in Britain at exotic locations, although it still happens in America. Guest authorship, I hope, is just about gone, but uh, uh, Fee will tell me otherwise. Um, physicians in promotions. Physicians should never get involved in promotion. It's absolutely appalling. Uh, and uh, use in unlicensed indications, I doubt if that happens really anything like uh, uh, as it did in the past. And then... The third problem, and the one I'm going to really spend most of the rest of this lecture talking about, is lack of transparency. The problem is threefold. It's, 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 it's for the failure to place the results of clinical trials uh, in the public domain. Too often, positive trials for license indications, positive trials for unlicensed indications, and negative trials uh, um, are, fail to be uh, available uh, for public scrutiny. And there's a consequent distortion of the evidence base. Does this occur at registration at the time a drug is going to the EMA? Well, I hope not. Um, when I was chairman of the Committee on Safety of Medicines, there were two instances where eventually it was discovered that a company had failed, or two different companies had failed, uh, to uh, um, um, uh, provide all the relevant evidence. Um, in fact, it was not due to the British subsidiary. It was the fault of the company over in the United States and in Europe. Uh, and the British subsidiary never knew about any of this evidence. Um, and they were embarrassed about it as we were angry uh, about it. For valuing effectiveness, it distorts the evidence base. If, if some studies are not published, the totality of the magnitude of benefit can become uh, diminished or at least uh, exaggerated. For clinical guideline development, and especially for us at NICE, the failure to publish negative studies is extremely uh, potentially damaging. We nearly got into bad trouble in the, early 19, in the early part of the last decade when we were developing a guideline on, on, on the treatment of depression in children and adolescents. A and there were a lot of studies that emerged largely actually due to the, uh, the uh, uh, the efforts of the Committee on Safety of Medicines that we had access to, which showed us that many of these antidepressants were ineffective, in fact, damaging in children, which we otherwise would never have heard about. We could have got ourselves into terrible trouble. And, of course, it distorts the evidence base in routine clinical practice. But it's particularly the negative trials that worry me, the absence of the publication of negative studies. 
And that is something that we need to make sure does not happen anymore. So what are the solutions? Well, firstly, the summary results of all clinical trials should be published in the public domain somehow or other. Don't care how, don't care where, but it's got to happen. We cannot any longer go on with selective publication. The second possible solution is that all the final study reports are put in the public domain. These are the reports uh, that are sent to uh, drug regulatory authorities, uh, which are far more detailed than the sort of uh, results of a clinical trial that you'd, uh, description of the results of a clinical trial you might read in the BMJ. They run to hundreds, sometimes thousands of pages. I'm not sure about uh, in the public domain. I would like to think that the final study reports do tally with the summary results that have been published in some reputable journal. And I would actually possibly like to think that the referees of the reports in the, uh, the summary papers had seen the final study reports, but they are huge, they are voluminous, and I'm really not sure that anyone who's not a techie is going to be the slightest bit interested. The third solution is individual paper, uh, individual patient data to be placed in the public domain. A and there are a number of reasons why this is potentially very valuable, not least of which, and perhaps most important, is it can allow much more powerful meta-analyses to be undertaken, uh, uh, and there have been many, many studies now using individual patient data that have provided um, far more information, far more relevant information um, than would have been achieved by just uh, a meta-analysis of the summary, summary data. There are two objections to uh, uh, the publication or the provision of individual patient data. Um, one is uh, mainly by pharmaceutical companies who are worried that people will call over the data uh, uh, and uh, reanalyze it and come to dis different conclusions. Yes, that may happen. I'm afraid it's a risk we're going to have to take. I'm much more worried, actually, about some organizations, um, for example, who are against immunization trawling uh, crawling over the data. But I think it's something we just have to accept. What worries me much, much more, and the reason why I'm cautious about all this, is I'm concerned about protecting the privacy of participants. It is not very difficult, particularly if we're doing, dealing with a rare disease, if you have the individual patient to actually to be able to de-anonymize the data. So I am concerned uh, about it. I would like it to be available to bona fide uh, investigators, and somehow we need to set in train a, an arrangement whereby there's some sort of safe haven uh, that allows uh, individual patient data to be available to bona fide uh, uh, investigators, particularly in relationship to avoiding using, uh, uh, disclosing, uh, or trying to disclose individual data. So my final thoughts are these. The pharmaceutical industry is necessary for the discovery and development of new products. No question about it. We can't, uh, um, there isn't any other way we can get new drugs. Uh, the discovery phase is sometimes goes on in academic departments, uh, universities, hospitals, and so on. That's fine. But the subsequent development and then the marketing and then the distribution is going to have to be by a, a, a pharmaceutical company. Secondly, the industry's business model, though, is going to have to change. It cannot go on any longer. The other big blockbuster days are gone, and most pharmaceutical companies realize it. Um, and, and with that needs to come other sorts of changes too. There are some new drugs we need that it will never be worthwhile a pharmaceutical company uh, developing or trying to develop uh, without some sort of reassurance. The classic case is antimicrobial agents. We're desperately in need of new antimicrobial agents. We haven't had a new one, a really new class for 30 or 40 years. We're desperately in need. But a pharmaceutical company who goes into starting a discovery program is going to make a loss at the end of the day. Because um, if, uh, if a new antibiotic with new properties uh, working in a different mechanism comes on the market, its use is going to be so heavily restricted by people like me that the consequences will be it will be used very little. Otherwise, we'll run into the emergence of resistance uh, to the new agent as we have with the older agents. And so actually, one of the good things uh, the European Union has done in the last few months is to provide 150 million euros for a consortium of pharmaceutical companies to start a, a discovery program. And this is the sort of thing I think in the future we're going to have to move towards. Some sort of sometimes public-private partnerships with various safeguards. 
Third, physicians must, not should really, must collaborate with the pharmaceutical industry in an appropriate manner. The pharmaceutical industry needs physicians uh, like me uh, to help uh, do clinical trials, to help uh, phase one studies, to help uh, in the early uh, phase design of phase two studies. Um, it needs us. What it does not need is for then me to be th their marketing man paid uh, thousands of dollars of time to go to sunny climes in North America and to tell lots of other physicians about their product. Um, I should be responsible for the final, as it were, publication of the results of the trial, and that's me over with. No more. So we need to work with the pharmaceutical industry in an appropriate manner. But ultimately, we will have the pharmaceutical industry we deserve. It's up to us. It's up to us physicians and others uh, in public health uh, to ensure the pharmaceutical industry behave appropriately. We made that happen in Britain in the 1980s in relationship to most of the marketing practices, and we need to make it happen now. And that's why I welcome the initiative. Probably we should have done this 10, 15 years ago, but never mind, Ian Chalmers can shoot me, as he always does every time we meet, um, uh, uh, or near strangle me. Um, we should have done this many years ago, and that's why I think the All Trials Initiative is so important, and why I was pleased on behalf of both NICE and the Royal Society of Medicine to support it. And I hope everybody else is too. Thank you very much, Fiona.